Paleota Pioneer presents Small Batch Science, Episode 10. Hi, welcome back to Small Batch Science by Paleota Pioneer, which is me, uh, Dr. Andy Hemmings. Um, I've reached a point where I'm kind of at that this is the last intentionally in the series of Clovis material culture. Uh, today focusing on stone tools that are not part of the biface preform point, used up point uh, trajectory. I'm going to focus primarily on Clovis blade cores, blades, and tools made on blades, and some of the maintenance debris from you know rejuvenating edges so you can keep uh, producing blades from the different kinds of blade cores. Then in part focusing on that because it's a very distinctive part of the Clovis toolkit that in many respects can be as diagnostic as finding fluted points. Then we'll get into the flake tools. I'll spend a little bit of time and hopefully not derail myself too much talking about overshot flakes and the tools made on those which again I, I would argue are equally diagnostic as the fluted points or some of the blade um, fragments. And then a number of the rare different kinds of things, the incised stones, predominantly from gold, uh, some hammerstone evidence, uh, other flake tools that are not necessarily as diagnostic as being, you know, they're not screaming Clovis technology and that they're uniquely Clovis, but they are part of the broader material culture and technological adaptation and toolkit and, and are important to us. The blades are particularly interesting for, for a number of reasons besides being one of the more widespread and, and readily recognizable technology, technological components of the Clovis material culture. They were also found on day one. Uh, these are, again, trodden out my favorites. The uh, first two Clovis points found at Clovis uh, in 1936 with the mammoth in the pit down there. Uh, heavily resharpened, very untypical Clovis, but a problem for another day that we've already spoken about. But when they found these things, uh, this was in the day when museums would just send stuff to other museums. This is a copy of E.B. Howard's dissertation, and one of the few you'll ever see outside of a rare book room from 1935. And he'd been cruising around in Clovis for three, four years at that point, and collecting material from different locations. And of course, Blackwater Draw, locality number one, is, is ends up being the mother load. Um, I don't have Cotter's articles a real one, except it's PDFs, um, but this is Chester and Stock on the animals that were found with the Clovis points, both the two bone ones and the other stone ones. But one of the things they had found right off the bat, and I have to sort of skip forward in my story a little bit to, to, to explain this, um, was part of one of these conical Clovis blade cores. It, what they what they had found was the end of one of these that had been knocked off. Literally, somebody just basically set up a platform and whack, knocked the, knocked the end off of it, then come back and retouched it all the way around and used it as some sort of end scraper or plane. Uh, Tom Label deserves a lot of credit for having recognized that in the collections of the Field Museum in Chicago, where it had been sent in the 30s and never been published until he got a hold of it. But by the time they had honest to goodness Clovis points in hand with the mammoths, they'd already found part of a, the Clovis blade technology. It's not really till the 60s with the discovery of the cache by uh, Green at Blackwater Draw, I want to say 63, that might just be the publication, it might have been found a year or two before that, of a cache of Clovis blades at Blackwater Draw, that they really enter the, the psyche and everyone goes looking for them. And, and in truth, it even with that, find the, the whole notion languishes until 99 when Mike Collins comes out with Clovis Blade technology. There's a ton of information, a lot of this history is in there as well. Um, some revisions to it are mentioned in the Clovis Technology book and a uh, chapter that Mike wrote in another book uh, revising some of his thoughts. The number one thing right off the bat was when, he fir when it first came out, and because they're so readily diagnostic and recognizable, these conical blade cores, Mike thought they outnumbered the wedge-shaped cores, and I have a couple of examples here that um, Bruce Bradley made. This is a real one from Victoria County, Texas, uh, same, you know, uh, Edwards Plateau shirt that fluoresces pumpkin, um, and you can readily tell what it is. But um, in truth, these do not outnumber the wedge-shaped cores 10 to 1, it's exactly flipped. The 
wedge-shaped cores outnumber conical cores by about 10 to 1 when so much material came out of the woodwork after Mike got the book out and, and sort of revised the data set because there's so much new information. Uh, a lot of what I have to show today is going to be modern experiment or replica attempts largely by Bruce Bradley, almost all of the Bruce Bradley for the, for the cores or in blade um, material, a lot of the flake stuff, uh, some of it even I made, but um, a number of other um, flint knappers did as well, and I'll try and give them credit as much as I can, but the, the problem I'm facing is uh, we make casts of bifaces and points and some other interesting things, but really not all of the other kinds of tools, and that's really a shame because there's the bulk of the information is, is in the other stuff. Uh, I also realized I really did intend for this to be the last of my Clovis material culture, but there's some specialty discussions that I'll do probably later on down the line after I get through a bunch of animals and other things, but uh, th there's a lot of angels on the heads of some of these pins that are probably worth talking about, so we'll come back to that. Um, in a grand sense, and I'll try and keep this a little bit higher level for, for the moment, but you know, feel free to ask questions and I'll do what I can to answer them. But uh, there's a number of really diagnostic features about what's going on here in terms of all of the um, uh, lapped removals of flakes from a, from a prepared end. My cast has some bubbles in it. That's why I got to keep it. The other one, the, the good one, finally went on display. But this is actually exhausted. The trouble with uh, rejuvenating either from this end, knocking it off, like that example I mentioned from Blackwater Draw, is actually from a bigger diameter core, so it looked a little bit different and would have been hard to do on this one. But um, the uh, removals, you, you can't really do anything to get another one. you got a pretty bad stack right in the middle, and it, it, it's going to take a lot of work, and you're going to end up taking quite a bit off of the length of the score just to get a couple more flakes. And they chose not to and discarded it. But some of the rejuvenation, rejuvenation and mate, core maintenance things, like, like knocking the one end off, on a rare occasion, and this is a flake Bruce did, there are examples, obviously not from a core this long, that Bruce was wailing away on, of actually hitting the other direction. They would actually, you know, break the end off and flake up the face to, to blow off both the end and, and create a new face for them to start working on. A number of the flakes, um, when we were writing the book, Bruce was, was chewing up a lot of material, trying to make examples of, or replicate examples of things we were seeing in the archaeological record predominantly at Galt, but other the, also at another number of other Clovis manufacturing loci where they're really not constrained by stone. They can go after making the, the big things and making lots of things. They're not conserving stone. They're trying to make exactly the kind of tool they want to, do the, to perform the function they want. And these backed by Cortex examples um, are actually really legit. There's a, quite a number of these. I'm not sure how many there are in the Little River complex in... Um, that Carl Yanni has worked on over the years, but um, I suspect they're there in, in, in numbers as well as they are at, at a number of sites in Texas besides Galt. There's a couple other things that I ought to mention too. Um, first, this isn't, this isn't actually a flake removed from this cobble, but the natural occurring cobble looks about like this. And one of the common ways you end up breaking into them is the platforms right here. It's, it almost fits, so I'm kind of putting it on here, but whack, blow the end off, and start setting it up so you have platforms, and instantly you can just start making removals. The curvature of the blades is, is a pretty, it's not 100%, but it's a very diagnostic or a very common occurrence, and it's a pretty good example of the platform up here, and you can see how much curvature there is through the length of this. This is a pretty interesting one that replicates a serrated piece from Gulf. Again, massive amount of curvature. They're not flat. Very rarely are they truly just flat. They're, and they're doing it on purpose. And why, I don't know that we exactly know. The serrated one like this at Gulf actually has a sickle sheen. It was being used to cut grass. The, 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 the use where along the edges, um, it was what they're doing with the grass, if it's bedding, if it's being used in making cordage or whoever, who knows what. I don't know that we can tell that. There's another one um, from Galt that's serrated that is clearly uh, meat cutting polish as well. So we have a steak knife and a sickle at, at Galt in, in the tools there. A number of them also 
at Galt used examples of blade art or end scrapers on blades. Um, one actually gave us pretty good evidence that it was hafted in a fashion very close to this. And I think we actually got the distance right um, based on where it came out the back of the handle. And the reason we know this is it broke, much like the, the experimental one, real nice hinge in there. But the piece that's still in here, embedded in here, was a little loose in the handle and it has polish on the front and back edges and you can see where you can actually get the thickness of the handle and you get the idea that it's a fairly ergonomic thing, which not a big surprise, but to find evidence of that is a kind of fun thing. Um, I guess some of the things I'm trying to ex show examples of are to help you recognize whether you're a napper and you want to do it and you know, reduce cores and blades in the same fashion as Clovis or as archaeologists and you want to understand that and see what you're really looking at when you um, find a, a bizarre flake that has you know the, the edge of where a bunch of blades have been removed but the platforms at the other end and the flake scars are going the wrong way for the length of the, the axis of the core or the axis of the flake. Uh, another thing that was really common and, and Bruce did a really nice job of, of replicating this on a number of a handful of flakes I have here is they would hook them such that when it went down and went across the end of the core, it hooked and blew the end of the core off. They're clearly doing it on purpose, but why, I, I, I don't know. In this example, and this is pretty accurate with, um, I want to say there's one from Black, an end scraper at Blackwater Draw that's like this, uh, but the, the blade long curved and it's sort of teardrop shape or it's thickest at the bottom, which was retouched and used as an end scraper similar to what was going on with, with the one here. Uh, it's not on a blade. I shouldn't have put that out, sorry. But something going on here that's it's interesting, and it sort of parallels a, a thing that I mentioned earlier about overshot flakes, is in a manner of speaking, these are, in fact, overshot flakes. Early on, when there's still cortex on, on ends, you can tell pretty quickly that the other end of the core was there. Uh, not always obvious on, on long flakes, although of course, I, of course I grab one that shows exactly that. Um, and you can also tell, besides like the really, you know, cleanly backed ones that I showed an example of a moment ago, this is a pretty rough edge of the raw cobble that, that, that you know, they started out with, knocked it off, has a nice usable edge, and it's backed in a fashion not as nicely or cleanly as the other one or, or this little guy, but most certainly, um, they're doing some of this on purpose, and we call those uh, corner blades. That they're essentially, and I can't show it as well, but this has a little bit of cortex. But imagine, you know, th this shot went all the way down. That it that it hadn't hinged out, you would have, um, you would have had an, a, a bit of that cortex on the far end of it. That um, we would think it shouldn't be there. That they wouldn't want it. But in point of fact, they're using flakes that have cortex on them in sort of strategic locations basically to make it easier for prehension. So it's easier to handle these and hold them and use them. Um, another style of core rejuvenation, and I confess I'm going to show, I was going to show it on the conical, but I don't believe it is. I think it's off the edge of a wedge-shaped core because of the number of flakes and how long this is. But you see the old removals from, from this surface, then in this example, Bruce I can't tell direction right now, but um, knocks it off and basically resets the about half or a third of, of probably what was a wedge shaped core. So I should think of it more in terms of uh, it's all oriented wrong. I don't I don't I can't orient this on one of these in the right fashion. But basically, it sets it back up so there's new platforms or new areas to prepare platforms and knock off more blades. That is a very common thing that there's quite a number of those flakes across Clovis sites that have blade technology. One that's a little rarer, but a, but spectacular and, and truly diagnostic, I don't think we would have any problem with this, is every now and then you would see, and this isn't a good example of it, it's, it's a flake that kind of fits, um, essentially knocking a hockey puck off the end. Then you get rid of the step, you get rid of all the old heiresses that are making, you know, if you isolate this, you're still going to only get a fraction of that kind of width out of a flake that probably doesn't go more than half the length of the core anyway. So they would come back, prepare an edge in a, in a spot somewhere, or prepare a platform, and knock it off. 
whack in this in this plane and remove essentially a hockey puck that's got little facets all the way around it. Well, a beautiful example of that is in the collections of the Minier site from Vernon, Arizona. And the reason it mattered there, that's in the Field Museum stuff that uh, Longacre and Greaves collected for, for um, Paul Martin long, long ago, early 60s, is that the site was published as Folsom or Weird Clovis. And the Clovis is all really, really tiny. And that largely has to do with the package size of the material available. And I've mentioned it before in one of the other videos. But the thing that's interesting about that is that the truly screaming Clovis diagnostic that everyone agrees on is the hockey puck shape and sized core tablet flake where they, from a conical core, knock the end off and it's screaming Clovis diagnostic. Um, an interesting thing here in Florida, we really don't have, I, I can't think of an example of a Clovis blade core. There are a number of flakes that are blades. There are true Clovis blades here in Florida, but not a lot of them. And I don't know that any, at any manufacturing location we've actually seen lots of them. There hasn't been 50 of them found in the spot that, that I know of. If you, if you know of such a thing, please reach out. I'd love to talk to you. It'd be great to know that there's some blade cores out here in Florida. Um, I think we'll stop for a minute and switch gears because otherwise I could run really long here. All right, so we're going to switch and talk about flake tools or tools made on flakes and a few other things that are in the other realm, the, the non-point realm of Clovis material culture. I um, have even fewer casts of real archaeological specimens. I only have, I think, four on the table now that are, or five on the table that are actual archaeological specimens. Because they're generally rarer and a lot of times not recognized for being as important as they really truly are. Uh, I'll, I'll skip, or I'll start for a second with uh, a couple of other uh, side things. This is more of a Dalton form, but there are in fact bifacial adzes in Clovis. There's a, uh, at least half a dozen of them at, at Gull. They've been turned up from a few other sites now as well, but the woodworking tools are starting to come out of the woodwork, if you'll excuse the terrible pun. Um, this is a pretty decent replica of a, of a chopping tool from Galt that had a weakly bifacial bit end that was chomped like that. One. The example from Galt actually has a flake broken off right here that is cemented in place that appears to be uh, it, calcium carbonate formed around what appeared to have been like fat or viscera and that it actually fused in place. You can really see the whole um, activity, what was going on, and the use square sort of indicates the same as well. A um, little bit stranger things, not on flakes, they're bifaces or on, on a whole cobble in this example. Um, but I'll talk about overshots for just a minute, in part because they're so diagnostic when it comes to seeing them used as tools. And I don't have a good example of a, of a bat wing. And somebody asked about this on one of the earlier videos, and I'll, that's why I'm sort of indulging or derailing myself a little bit here. But in early stage preforms, obviously you would expect to see them in later stage preforms or finished points. You're not likely to see complete overshots. The edges will be obliterated. And in fact, the flakes that are coming across, you know, beyond midline or beyond three quarters, are really doing the job that they need at that point. They're not trying to blow off the other end. And even if you're getting a feather termination, which of course makes it difficult to tell. I think this actually is an overshot flake from an early stage biface somebody made. Um, that it did in fact go all the way across. That's just one of the things that can happen, and this is a real good example of when things go bad. This is not the far side of the flake, this is the platform. And in fact what you're looking at is an edge collapse. It looks like the, a, a nice overshot. It is not. What this is is the, the platform bit too much and went across and it was a nice flake. It removed a lot. But the problem is this is not the termination. It's the origination. And this is exactly the problem with what are called overshot flakes at the Windy City site in Maine. They're edge collapse. There's, they are not overshots. This is a nice piece of North Carolina rhyolite. Looks like it's an overshot flake. It has a hinge termination and came out. It is not it didn't go all the way across, it missed. The smaller piece 
actually does have a little bit of the far side and you can recognize that in point of fact this is an overshot flake. This is a, one of the few casts I have. You can see the nice lip uh, platform. You can read out, even in the cast you can see the direction of force and travel. Um, and in fact actually did go all the way across, caught a little bit at the edge of the far by face. It's basically in about uh, something like this kind of a position on a, on, a, on a Clovis point that has made it sloth hole. They came back, retouched all the edges, even the end, and used this as a, as a cutting or scraping implement. Uh, even as a nice little notch that somehow blew out the end inside. This has been my pocket knife from a flake that Claude Van Order made. Um, it had a nice spoke shave on it, another tool that does show up regularly. I made graver spurs and I've been using it. So it's not actually Clovis, but it's pretty close and it's most certainly in the manner of trying to replicate um, this guy and, and a couple others that are out there um, from Sloth Hole. But the point being, complete overshot used as a tool and, and screaming at a Clovis manufacturing site and with a Mastodon kill like Sloth Hole that it's, um, that's really what it is. The um, other examples I just show to really show in the manner of because they are modern replicas and experiments and, and many of these that I made I was just picking up other nappers nice flakes and what I was after was to get um, usable pieces that I was making bone tools or, or atlatls or whatever I was making but I wasn't so worried about making them look like Clovis things I was making them so that they would behave like Clovis I was trying to do it the same way but not trying to make it a specific archaeological example so you know big cortical flake that's been retouched and used as a scraper or cutting tool very common things not as diagnostic as the overshot or blade and blade core tools but you know we recognize them when you find them in context uh, this is a gigantic flake that was used as a cutting side scraper and end scraper knife I, I don't I don't know but this is from the cache at Wenatchee there's a very similar example um, out of this kind of material at uh, Blackwater Draw it's a little bit the, the one at Blackwater Draw is a little bit longer and has a bigger curve on it um, I don't know that we would call it a type of tool but there's a couple of them out there made rather extravagantly large for, for whatever diabolical purpose but um, again trying to look for patterns in both form and in the process of making them in a specific fashion time and time again which you see in like little ovate scrapers thumbnail scrapers little, little lozenge shaped uh, end scrapers that can be kind of ovate a little bit sometimes too again not necessarily diagnostic diagnostic of clovis but certainly within the paleo indian tradition and when you find them in clovis it should of course not be much of a surprise um, Moving away from the bigger flake tools, um, one of my favorite areas and specialties is, I don't know if you can even see it, but there's an exceedingly small graver spur on here. And I was making the, and using a number of these to drill holes in bone, trying to replicate some of the early, early eyed needles. And one of the eyed needles has a one millimeter hole in it. And let me tell you what it took to figure out how to resharpen my antler pressure flaker to go after, a, yeah, and you really took specific kind of flakes that had to be thin enough but have a, a decent cross section, especially if you can get them sort of isolated like, like this guy. This is a more robust or bigger example from early on. But if you can see it, it's essentially a broken flake that has a triangular cross section. And the triangular cross section, of course, holds up better, but getting a tiny, tiny triangular cross section like that little guy to drill a hole that's only a millimeter across really lets you see the process of, of how these things are made and the thought that goes into making the tool to make the tool to drill the hole in the tool you're trying to make. And, and of course, save yourself some trouble, drill the hole in a blank of bone and then shape the, the needle around it because you're going to drive yourself absolutely insane if you try and drill a hole as the final step in finishing the needle. A couple of other things that are, are rare, rarer, but you know only because of maybe not recognizing the finds or thinking to look for them, but um, uh, limestone grinding slabs, this is actually sandstone I think, uh, another nice limestone that I naturally found that had a groove in it and I've used quite a bit um, just for shaping and there are real good examples of this from the early archaic across the southeast. Uh, 
I don't know that they've been found that we would recognize as Clovis other than a few slabs that do have you know, scraping and, and grooves starting to wear on them, sort of like this piece of sandstone, what I've done with that. Um, we know that they're using cortical limestone, both in like the plaquettes that are incised and engraved, if you will, at, um, at this is a, one of the more famous examples from Galt that has either fletching or wheat, or fletching on atlatl darts, or, or, or it's a grain. I, we could argue about this one for quite some time. Um, but again, cortical limestone that's been cut and incised, ground and incised and I, I threw out a couple of my hammer stones that I that I like for small work and stuff and a cast of the uh, mammoth ivory billet from Blackwater Draw not a lot of surviving Clovis napping tools but what really does show up and I didn't have a very good example of this at all are cortical chert flakes or, or chart, cortical um, chert nodules that are being used as hammer stones and basically it works out to be a combination or mid-grade hard and soft hammer. It's a, it's a lighter version of a hard hammer that absorbs without being too brittle, with, absorbs a lot of the force and, and that has turned up a couple of Blackwater Draw and a couple of other sites in Texas. Um, not a lot of them but it's one of those things we should be on the lookout for as, as are all these things and because the numbers on these are small or they're in the collections and just not discussed as much it's a little frustrating and I and I, I think now I'm convinced I'll come back to this and uh, revisit some of these as specific areas that we can expand on in the future but sort of a broad overview to finish up looking at Clovis material culture all the stone stuff in the points preforms blades other kinds of, of, of flake tools and stone tools and other things including some neat, neat art and ornamentation and of course my favorites from one of the videos of back ago the um, antler and ivory and bo uh, bone tools from especially the things made from extinct taxa so if you have questions far away um, we'll be back shortly and I'm going to start in on talking about a lot of the Pleistocene animals on the landscape at the same time as Clovis and pre-Clovis people in North America so Thanks for tuning in, and we'll be back soon. Thanks for watching.